Hey everybody, it's Josh Rhodes, your host with the most here on the Retro Monster Truck Review. This week, Matt told me he was going to cover something a little bit different. We're going back to the year 2002, and we're going to be talking about Pro-MT Race Day, an event that aired in 2002 over on the Travel Channel. Now, Matt did not specify to me who he was going to have on the show this week, so it's a surprise to me as well as to you guys. So without further ado, let's just jump right into it here. Monster Truck Race Day 2002 featuring Pro-MT Monster Trucks at Daytona International Speedway. What could get any better? Here on the Retro Monster Truck Review. Welcome everybody again to another episode of the Retro Monster Truck Review. I am Matt Stoltz and uh, no co-host this week. I'm going to be flying solo, but it's time everybody. We're finally getting to it. It's Monster Trucks 2000, the new Thrillennium. We're coming at you from Felsmere, Florida. Man, it's going to be an awesome show. I mean, we just had to do it eventually, right? So, uh, unfortunately, hey buddy, how's it going? In. Who the heck is that? Who do you think it is? It's my show. Josh? Yeah. What's up, buddy? How's it going, everybody? Josh Rhodes, the official host of the Retro Monster Truck Review, back in action here again. And uh, I don't know what event you were talking about, but I thought we were going to talk about uh, Daytona, Florida in 2002. Oh, we could do that. Let's do that instead. That sounds better. Yeah, that's actually a little, a lot better than the one you were proposing there. <laughs> Ladies been, and gentlemen, man? I'm back I... here on the show. I, do what? I, I, I didn't pay them Teamsters enough, apparently. I thought you were gone. No, you didn't. No, no, you didn't pay them enough at all. Oh. They, they actually came and they actually brought me ice cream. So I don't know what you actually did to pay them, but they actually brought me a nice frozen treat. Well, I didn't get no ice cream. Well, but how you been doing, buddy? Where, what you been up to? Dude, I have been all over the place. I've been to Texas three times this year. Just got back from Salt Lake City a little while ago, maybe a week or so ago. Finished up the Stadium Red Tour. We crowned our champion, ladies and gentlemen. Tom Mintz has won yet another points championship for Monster Jam. Shocker, right? Uh, been having a lot of fun on the road as a tech official and learning the tricks of the trade. Uh, got to run RII a lot this year on the sidelines and got to stage a bunch of trucks and watch a bunch of racing passes go down. And I got to tell you, it was one of those seasons where it just everything was going up and down all season long. And then it finally came down to that last event where Tom walked away with the victory. And I couldn't be a prouder guy standing on the sidelines seeing a guy that's literally just down the road from me winning a points championship for Monster Jam. So, so you're the guy that everybody's complaining about on the internet turning trucks off too early. Oh, no, no, no. That was the yellow tour. Okay. I got you. You can send yeah. all inquiries to the Retro Monster Truck Review uh, Facebook page and send all your complaints about uh, people shutting off Tom and whatever. Uh, that was Josh's doing, apparently. Hey, no. I, that was not me. <laughs> he said he was a tech official uh, running the RII. I mean, you heard it, folks. Yeah, but I didn't sh I didn't shut anybody off for a headlight. Shots fired, everybody. Shots fired. All right, we're going <laughs> to skip ahead here, Matt. What have you been up to, buddy? Oh, been a little of this, a little of that. You know, we're recording here today. Uh, this weekend, I'm heading up to uh, Brookville, PA for the Renegade Monster Truck Tour. Uh, Zane and his promotion going to be putting on another good show up there at the uh, Jefferson County Fairgrounds, I believe. So I'll be heading up there with my buddy Chris Uhas. And uh, I'm not sure, you know, when we're going to be airing this episode here, but that's that's what's happening this weekend for me. Uh, of course, I was at TNT Motorsports Unfinished Business. I don't think we've done any recording since that event happened. I snuck in one final recording with our friend Nick Davis there right before the event and uh, that Stafford show. Man, we, we went right from that into one of the greatest weekends ever in monster truck racing an amazing event for everybody that was there we had a ton of fun it was like a, a nerd fans dream to be there made a lot of new friends uh got to meet some people that you know i had been talking to online for years so that was cool to to have happen and got to help tire up uh the thunder chicken there uh i was i was on jack duty i wasn't doing the heavy lifting but you know it was a good time great weekend with a lot of great people and man it's something that if you missed it uh I don't know what else to tell you. Keep an eye out for the videos officially coming out from the Monster Truck Wars people. You'll get a full produced TV type episode, Michael has said, uh, officially at some point. So if you missed the event live, you'll at least get to see it kind of similar to how we did. 
And that's something I actually cannot wait to see. I've seen video clips of it here and there. I've seen a, a full broadcast of it, but you don't really get the sense of everything until you hear it from the source itself. So it's good to know there's going to be something coming out from Michael Harper and the Monster Truck Wars people uh, as far as that event goes. I'm really looking forward to seeing that. And you definitely had the better weekend that weekend. I was stuck in Philadelphia and a torrential downpour. So <laughs> you definitely had the better weekend that weekend than me. Yeah, you could have been in Philadelphia at a casino winning ten grand, and I still had a better weekend than you because you were in Philadelphia. This is very true. Uh, not a fan of the Philadelphia Eagles, if you can't tell. Just saying. But anyway, uh, Matt, let's skip right in here. We are here in Daytona International Speedway. Pro MT Monster Truck Race Day is what this is called. And I believe the YouTube channel you can watch this off is Hate Breeder. It's Michael Disroach's channel. He's a good buddy of mine from a few that's, years back. Is, is that Guy Dave knows Roche? his monster truck. Yeah, yeah, something like that. I always called him Roach. Roach. I heard he likes Bob. Yeah, he, that, was his, that was his nickname was Roach. I heard he's a Bob Breen fan. Uh, maybe just a little bit. Yes, that that video might also be on that channel as well. <laughs> <laughs> this this, uh, this event here in Daytona, you know, this was recorded uh, April 26th and 22nd, or excuse me, 26th and 27th, 2002 at the Daytona International Speedway. And what's weird is, you know, this episode, it was a travel channel special that didn't air until all the way into 2003. I think it was like maybe February or something. And almost a full year delay before this makes airtime, and they're talking about how, you know, check out Pro-MT if they come to your town, and then Pro-MT stopped after 2002. All the people that watched this show got all excited and then never got to see Pro-MT live by the time that this episode aired. Very, very unfortunate, but it was produced by the same people, uh, Film Garden Entertainment, that did the Secrets of Monster Trucks TLC special. So we see a lot of crossover footage used from those events like in Lima in 1999 and some of the other stock footage that they have. Bigfoot, of course, had a hand in the production, providing a lot of their video footage and logistical expertise. So it's a really cool kind of interesting special. And Travel Channel did a lot of this kind of stuff back then with all kinds of different motorsports, didn't they, Josh? Yeah, they certainly did. Um, I myself, I, I actually remember watching this on Travel Channel years ago. And whenever I was at home here the last few days, and the first thing I could think of is that hey, we haven't done a Pro-MT show on the Retro Monster Truck Review. So that's when I hit you up and said, hey, let's go record this episode. And uh, this particular episode to me is a quintessential Pro-MT whenever you get to see Pro-MT action, that is. Uh, there's a lot of skip editing in this episode here, uh, Monster Truck Race Day in 2002. And uh, just let's we'll give a backstory here real quick, Matt, on actual Pro-MT itself. Like you said, from 2000 to 2002, I believe, is when this point series ran on. It was presented by the Truxpo Company. Uh, and I believe that they hit just about every major speedway that they could. And when I say major speedway, I'm talking Bristol International Speedway, Daytona International Raceway, Talladega Super Speedway, places like that for monster truck racing. And they usually ideally use the back stretch. Uh, I believe at Talladega they use the front stretch, though. Yeah, it's interesting. They were affiliated somehow. One of their like executives for Truxpo was uh, tied in with ISC, International Speedway Corporation, which, of course, are the tracks that NASCAR kind of pseudo owns through ISC. And they ran a lot of those ISC venues. Now, Bristol was an interesting one because that was an SMI property. Uh, I think they only ran there the one year in 02, if I'm not mistaken. But it, you know, they did run the big speedways, and this was the whole idea, kind of like a jamboree, but a little bit bigger even maybe because they had the manufacturers. They got the show and shine, all these other tough trucks, and the monster trucks, of course, being the star attraction coming into all these major markets with all these huge seating capacities, you knew they weren't going to run out of room to put people. No, no, they were not going to run out of room, especially at Daytona International Speedway. The uh, way Pro MT brackets worked was a very interesting way. And if, uh, if you, and you might jump in here. I, I just did this from memory. I'm not 100% sure if this is correct, but I want to say 10 trucks were invited, and the final two spots were between any other trucks that showed up, and they would qualify to try and make those final two spots in the 12-truck field. That part of it, honestly, I'm not 100% sure on. Um, they called it open qualifying and a lot of the event coverage from the day. So I'm not sure if there was invites involved. I don't know the logistics of it itself. But in this case in Daytona, 
we had 14 trucks show up trying to make a 12 truck field. So there were trucks that weren't going to make the show and would have to sit, you know, and wait for the next time. Um, Rich Blackburn in the Viper truck. This was his first weekend out trying to compete on this pro MT tour. And unfortunately he didn't make either show, uh, the slowest qualifier, not by a large margin. He just couldn't squeak himself into the field as kind of a newcomer to the industry at that time. But he went out and tried to get the job done. I think he ended up maybe making uh, a race or two by the end of the season because he did gain some points, uh, when I was looking at the pro MT points for 2002. So he, uh, of course, you know, got a newer truck and came back and had a very long and successful career in the industry, but he's still kind of new here for this 2002 season for pro MT. One thing that always made pro MT stand out to me when I was a kid was the fact that it had a stock body rule for the first two seasons in pro MT competition. So you would see trucks like Samson with the arms sticking out in the front or Predator with the kitty cat front end on it. They could no longer run those and they had to run a stock body. Samson, of course, ran a famous, really cool looking red body that just said Samson on the door. And I got to tell you, for his as plain as that looked, it still looked awesome. It was a callback to the old Samson back in the uh, late 80s and, uh, when that truck was competing out there with Bigfoot and on, on the USHRA tour. The Predator truck, though, Allen went a completely different direction. He's actually broken this body out in the last few years as well. It's just a Dodge body, and it's a yellow Predator that's, I don't know, it's one of those ones that still sticks out in my head, Matt, is just a really cool paint job and an alternate version of a, of a truck that just stands the test of time, in my opinion. I love the look of the Pro MT Predator. You know, it's got the yellow with the red, and then it fades back to blue. I got to see it live in 2004 or five, I think, uh, at one of my local shows. And Alan's been known to bust that body out every few years and reuse it again whenever he needs to to do something a little bit different. So it's cool to see that truck out there and running. Now, for 2002... They did change the rule back to where you could have a concept body. Uh, I'm, I can't remember. I feel like I read somewhere at one point that it still had to be a truck-based body. I'm not, I can't remember if that's true or not. Uh, Samson, of course, fits within that because it's a truck body with the arms added. But uh, Pizzo decided to stick with the Dodge here for the 2002 season. And the three national champions for Pro MT that were crowned over the years, shocker, the first two were Bigfoot trucks, Eric Tack and Tonka Bigfoot, and then, of course, Bigfoot and Dan Runte. And lastly, in 2002, your champion was Mark Hall and the Raminator. We'll get to Raminator in a little bit. We're going to go ahead and car kind of start working our way into this coverage right here. Uh, the opening line here that jumped out at me was, this is no fairy tale. This is 10,000-pound steel gladiators doing battle on the ground and in the air. The intro is various clips of current Pro MT monster trucks on the circuit. They cover a country mile in a New York minute. They're big enough to be from Texas, and they're competing side-by-side -side at Daytona. Uh, actually, they're big enough to be from St. Louis. If you're a monster truck fan, you know that that is true. I thought the intro here had some decent writing, especially that uh, phrase, they cover a country mile in a New York minute. That's that's pretty clever. Yeah, I, I thought um, that was good. That was. I like that. And like you said, we get a lot of cool different footage here from the last you know probably four to five years of monster truck action uh throughout the uh, bigfoot archives that i'm sure they supplied i got we got hollywood hogan going over at the beach we've got some old footage from lima 99 usa action in the uh rca dome so we've got a you know a variety of footage here and we're kind of introducing the general public because remember this is a travel channel special this isn't a motorsports channel it's not a motorsports program necessarily like that's a regular airing this is a singular hour-long special that aired you know some night at probably 8 p.m on the travel channel in prime time and this was a way to expose a lot of the general public to monster trucks and especially to pro mt that hadn't maybe seen it before yeah, they certainly did that, and uh, I got to tell you, the intro, like you said, great writing. Uh, I enjoyed the music. I was surprised I was en I enjoyed the music of this, because uh, you know my my famous thing is I don't really like the uh, Monster Smash final music, but this music it wasn't too bad. I enjoyed it. I liked the narration that was over it. Uh, we did see some classic clips here spliced together. We saw a really good one of Executioner, as well as a classic clip from Bigfoot where it's racing against a gravedigger truck, and you just see the truck. The front four link in the left side just folds right under, and you see Bigfoot coming at the camera, rolling over. I believe Gene Patterson was driving that truck right there. Uh, 
about the most you were going to get of a gravedigger on this show was that slight little clip right there. <laughs> but anyway, uh, they're big, they're bad, and they're all brawn is another quote that I liked out of there. And also, monster trucks are superheroes or superheroes of the four wheeled vehicles. Another good quote. So the narrator himself is coming out here and doing a fantastic job of nailing these one liners that really do fit within the industry. You know what I like during this sequence is there's a shot of Firestone Wilderness pulling a slap wheelie down like it looks like maybe a pit road of a speedway. Do you see the mm -hmm. wheelie bars that they had on the back of Bigfoot 15 there? I thought that was kind of something interesting. A wheelie bars with like wheels on the back of it sticking out the back of the Firestone Wilderness truck. Yeah, good eye on that. I caught that as well. Uh, something you, you rarely see. And you honestly, you see it on RC vehicles. You don't actually see it on the one ones. Yeah, it was something that I don't think I had ever seen them use before or since. I'd love to have more information on that event. Uh, the Bigfoot guys, I'm sure you've got it in your archive. Throw it up on YouTube if you could for us. Yeah, that'd be a good one to see on YouTube. Nice little clip of Firestone with uh, wheels on the back. And the wheels on the truck go round and round. Is it, That's uh, actually a quote within the industry. <laughs> That's, that's it. So we get a lot of different, you know, uh, intro shots here, and we're getting a very high level description of, you know, what monster trucks are, what they do. Um, and then we kind of pivot that right into introducing the Pro MT series. Yep, we sure do. We get a quick, quick clip of NASCAR racing here, which, by the way, this immediately got a negative 10 on my review thing because they show a clip of Jeff Gordon leading Dale Earnhardt, and that's just not right. That's not right. You can't have that. I'm sorry, Pro-MT. But anyway, uh, Professional Monster Truck Organization, or Pro-MT, as uh, the, 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 is taking the game to a world-renowned tracks to test the speed of these giants. We'll be in the backseat witnessing the growth of this new racing circuit. How does it work? pro MT combines the fun of monster truck racing with professional drag racing. And that is a very good quote that basically describes pro MT. Yeah, you know, the pro MT series got a lot of the internet coverage in its day. But unfortunately, we didn't get to see much of it on television. You know, we had this special. I want to say they repurposed some footage or showed footage from... You know, I'll swear in the weekend on another show, but I could not find it in my archives. I feel like they put it on another travel channel, like half hour show, Kings of the Road or something. But, um, you know, we didn't get to see a lot of Pro MT on TV. We got to see it on some yeah. Bigfoot home videos and stuff. And they were, so, I can't remember if they actually aired or not, but they were supposed to air Pro MT races on an internet streaming service called Voom. At one point, I remember people talking about it way back in the Mayhem Easy Board days when I first got onto the forums, and I don't know if those ever actually made it to air. I feel like if they did, somebody would probably would have found them and, and posted them by now online, but they had plans to get this thing a TV deal. It was kind of a next generation, again, early online streaming thing, but I don't think it ever really materialized. Yeah, it's unfortunate that it didn't because Pro MT was exactly what they just said right there. Combined professional monster truck racing with professional drag racing. This was a pro tree that they had at these events. They spent a lot of time, as you'll see later in this broadcast, setting up this timing system that they yeah. had. And this system had been used has been used in years past. I believe Bob Chandler actually owns the system. And uh, I think it ended up get one of them ended up getting destroyed, if I remember correctly at a checkered flag production show years later but the pro mt system is still around i remember i remember i believe they fixed the one that had gotten destroyed and i believe that they still use this system uh for special events but i could be wrong i could be completely wrong but that's what i've been told yeah it's cool to see the monster trucks running on a full set of timing lights with the et you know beams and they actually had mile an hour they had a mid-track time that they used to track uh, as well to make you know keep an eye on their statistics and see how the trucks were reacting at different times during the track and I think they I can't remember if they awarded points or not for having like you know best ET or best reaction time of the weekend or not but they used to note it in the event coverages which I always thought was pretty cool see who's really pushing that envelope trying to cut the tree down yeah and you learn a lot about a driver at that point too uh, like we said, though, Pro MT combining the fun of professional monster racing and drag racing. The very next line, though, is something I don't know that I didn't necessarily like as far as the comparison goes. It says that Pro MT is a no holds barred competition, pedal to the metal, pedal to the floor, clash of the titans, unlike any other motorsport out there. There's even a $40,000 purse. 
I don't know. I don't like the term no holes barred used here to describe this. I don't know about you, but to me, the first thing I think of is pro wrestling. Uh, mere puffery. Uh, marketing speak, you know. Eh, even still, though, I don't know. Pedal to the metal, Clash of the Titans. I don't know. It's, it's almost too hokey for me going on uh, for for the series that you're trying to represent as being a professional drag racing series. I guess the alternative would be two trucks race in a straight line to a finish line. Doesn't hey, quite have the same. Doesn't quite have it the same. Doesn't rate. quite have the same ring to it. But I don't know. When I hear "No Holds Barred," that's the first thing I think of is a really crappy Hulk Hogan movie. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Pro MT was operated in a little bit more <laughs> of a, a professional fashion. Uh, uh, at least I would say. Here we get introduced to surprise, surprise, Bob Chandler. He says, this is a huge facility. They've got a great name. NASCAR is unbelievable, and to race at the, one of their tracks is just dynamite. I like, Bob's got some enthusiasm here talking about Daytona. This is a hallowed hall. This is the home of stock car racing for many, many people. So to see monster trucks coming into this venue is, is exciting. It's the world center of racing, as they say, I believe. And let's not mm -hmm. forget, you know, this is 2002 airing in 2003. Um, NASCAR in America is really hitting, getting close to hitting its zenith in terms of mainstream popularity. Any Anything that you could do to attach yourself to NASCAR during these years basically guaranteed that you were going to get money thrown your way in some fashion. And uh, you know, we're going to NASCAR tracks. NASCAR is a really big thing. Um, it was really cool to see the monster trucks go in and being able to utilize these facilities, you know, not necessarily with NASCAR people there, but in those big markets. They said Bob introduced us as the visionary veteran who invented the fat tire phenomenon. I like that quote. I'm sorry, but the fat tire phenomenon. I want to put that on the back of one of my RC trucks. This fat tire phenomenon right across the tailgate. That's a bit of a tongue twister if you say it enough times quick, too. Hey, I tried. We, uh, uh, he also <laughs> says, Bob also says here, he says, talks about the first car crush and how amazed the crowd was and enthused by it. Because it was such a silly thing. And he says it with kind of a chuckle in his voice. Uh, I like I like that Bob has a little bit of a humor involved with the sport as well. And you can't take yourself too seriously. You know, uh, we don't see this necessarily in the TV show. But those of us who were knowledgeable about the industry at this point, you know that this is more or less a competitor-run organization. Meaning... Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, Bob Chandler and Bigfoot footed the bill for the creation of a lot of Pro MT. Eric Meager is the president and and running the operation for Pro MT. Uh, Tim Hall, you know, Dan Patrick are all directors. They're all involved. And you know, I think that in my opinion, Pro MT is a bit even more legitimate than the Penda series was. And I know I'm going to get flamed in the comments, but the Penda series had, I feel, a lot more politics going on behind the scenes than Pro MT did because Pro MT was more of a collaborative effort between a lot of the teams working together, whereas Penda was similar, but certain teams had a lot more influence uh, over certain things and, and could get things changed to suit themselves better. Um, whereas Pro MT, I think, was a little bit more of a level playing field. Yeah, it certainly was. Uh, I wish we could have seen more of Pro MT. We talked about it earlier. There wasn't much television it's, coverage here. It's great action. I mean, we've seen the Bigfoot folks put some of that video up from a couple different races over the years on their YouTube channel. It's tremendous racing. Absolutely great stuff. And we've seen some of the highest speed racing crashes ever come out of Pro MT. Uh, Rick Disharoon absolutely destroyed Backdraft. I think it was a Nazareth PA. Um at one of the races, I mean, that truck just got absolutely grenaded across the infield at a really, really high speed. These trucks are going through the speed traps at anywhere between 50 and 60 mile an hour, which they look like they're going even faster than that. And you imagine a truck getting up on the bicycle and crashing. We see uh, Steve Macklin and Nitro Fish here at the beginning of the show go over in Daytona, the, what was that, in 2000 or 2001, and uh, just a really horrible crash. And these guys were really pushing it to go after that win. 
No, yeah, they, they were really pushing it as hard as they possibly could out there. Um, I got to tell you, though, this might be, and you just, you just talking about how fast this was, this might be the second fastest era in the Monster Trucks history. Like obviously, Penda, they're pushing speeds out at Penda that I don't think could ever be matched again today. They're pushing upwards of 65, 70 miles an hour here in Pro MT, 350-foot-long course that they're racing on. However, they're still pushing speeds of 60, 60, maybe 63, somewhere around in there, as I think was the fastest one of these had gotten clocked at one point on this 350-foot track. The other unique thing about Pro MT is in Penda back in the day, some of the races were finished at the end of the cars or a little bit past the last car. Here, these guys are jumping, landing, and they still got to book it about another 50, 60 feet straight to the finish line. They yeah. have to break those beams. That was something I think that they kind of did on purpose for Pro MT. It was they wanted those guys to have to get on the throttle after they landed off the second set of cars and race to the finish. And part of it, you know, was the timing system that they were using. You're using a beam system. You have to have the trucks on the ground uh, so that there's not a huge variability in where your tire is going to catch the finish beam. Um I, I'm not exactly sure how they did it in the Penda series. I think they had some kind of equipment that that read, you know, vertically to a degree because they were able to get times. Or I don't know if they used a timing camera like TNT did that was time stamped. But um, it was really, really a cool system. And again, we're running a longer track now, 350 feet instead of 300. We have got ETs obviously that are longer because of that. But I'd argue some of these race especially like darlington where they were really running hard um in those later years last couple years of of pro mt they may have been going faster than the penda days Uh, the ramps were a little steeper of course uh, but i think your mile an hour at the far end might have been rivaling those penda days cut over to bob chandler where we cut from bob chandler excuse me to bigfoot's number one driver of course dan runty and they talk about a little bit of his motorcycle background motocross background that he had and uh, then he'd seen Bigfoot when he was at some exhibition events when he was younger. He says, I personally like that. I spoke with uh, spoke with some guys from Bigfoot. And then, heck, later on, look at it. Now Dan Rente is the driver of Bigfoot. Not only the driver, he's the number one driver of Bigfoot. And a little, little clip of humor here again at the beginning of, uh, excuse me, the end of Dan's interview. He says, I personally like that after speaking with Dan, we get a clip of him jumping over the plane with the narrator saying, it was when he got behind the wheel of Bigfoot that Runte's career took off. And then you see the truck fly over the plane, and he finishes <laughs> the segment with literally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good production. Yeah, I, I like that. That was really cool. I like So far, everything in this has been really great. Uh, Dan, as far as a legacy of Bigfoot goes, it's tough. Everybody's gunning for you. No matter who you, who you are, when they're up against you, they want to beat Bigfoot because it's been in it so long. Bigfoot, obviously, the first monster truck. Of course, people still, even in 2002, even in 2022, people still want to beat Bigfoot. And congratulations to go out, by the way, to Dalton Widener, who did just that on the toughest monster truck tour earlier this year. Skipping ahead, though, as we leave the Bigfoot side of things, we are whisked away, Matt, to a magical land known as Champaign, Illinois, to visit the Hall brothers. And at this time, the Halls were veterans of the sport. However, they had just recently secured a sponsorship from one of the big three major auto promotions here in the world or here in the United States. And that's of course is Dodge. They had just gone away from what was the executioner and in its place is now the Raminator and Ramunition and Ramunition at the time is one of the most unique looking vehicles out there on the tour. Yeah, you know, Raminator new for 2002, debuted in the Pontiac Silver Dome. They've been running the truck for a couple months at this point because we're here in April. But this is the first event, the debut for the Ramunition truck. And it's kind of the test bed for the Hall brothers throughout this first 2002 season. They're trying a lot of different stuff. They've got different shocks compared to Raminator. And the obvious thing that's so different is those Goodyear turf tires with the the big bubbles on the sidewalls that they're trying to find a way to get a lighter tire to go faster, but still put the power down. Yeah. And these trucks, uh, I believe pro MTU weight limit was 9,500 pounds. They were trying to push it as much as they could with the ammunition truck. Always been kind of known as the R and D truck in the hall of brothers stable. And as you said, right here, brand new shocks, different tires. As Tim Hall says, a whole lot of parts that haven't proven themselves yet. A national event is kind of a tough place to do some testing, but it's the only place we can really test anything to know it, to apply it to Raminator down the road. Of course, Raminator is obviously and has been for the last 20-some-odd years 
the number one Dodge monster truck in America. Here, though, it's brand new. It's untested, a lot of untested equipment. And I can remember seeing Raminator personally early in early days of Raminator back in uh, 2003, 2004 at Indianapolis at the fairgrounds over there. And they couldn't keep transmissions in this thing because they were pushing such horsepower behind the wheel of that thing. And here in this particular event, you can see they're pushing quite a bit of horsepower to be able to do some of the things that this truck does on this straight line course. Uh, and then just like that, though, we are completely whisked away from Champaign, Illinois, and we're taken all the way to Ohio to see Dan Patrick working on Samson. And heavy sponsorship is something that doesn't mean a trip to the winner's circle. Another good line here uh, as we see Dan Patrick fit the bill as one of the privateers within the sport. Dan is a pro MT director, and he's built most of the competition. He has, you know, one of the premier component manufacturers and chassis manufacturers in the industry built a good number of the trucks that are here trying to compete in Daytona this weekend. You know, Circleville, Ohio, uh, not all that far from Columbus. You can still get racks roast beef sandwiches in that part of Ohio. The best darn roast beef sandwich you've ever had. Arby's, you can kiss my butt. This is this is true. I, he speaks the truth, ladies and gentlemen. Make me wish I would have went to Ohio at some point this season. <laughs> Uh, Dan Don't Patrick, get me wrong. Arby's ain't bad, but Rax is a 10 out of 10. Dan Patrick says here, I have the pressure of wanting to do well because that's me and what sells my trucks. We have 54 trucks out there that we've built at that time. 54 trucks, Matt. That yeah. is a lot of trucks that he has built. And he's got a trucks. lot more coming. There's a lot more coming. I don't even know what the number is up to now, but it's a lot more than 54. That's for sure. Well, it's got to be triple that by this point. Patrick is definitely a mover and shaker in the industry and the, the facility that they have out there in Ohio is just phenomenal. All the fabrication that they do right there in house. And, you know, we get to see some of these different competitors, which is pretty cool, kind of getting a little bit of a profile and a background on each of them before we head in to the actual event here. Um, they they kind of pivot this into now showing some of the independents that are here in Daytona. Yeah. And there's one thing to jump on real quick as far as this intro goes is I don't know about you. But to me, I felt they spent just a little bit too much time on Bigfoot. I spent, I felt they spent at least two minutes longer on Bigfoot than they should have on this. Uh, I, I kind of wanted to hear a little more backstory of Dan Patrick. He's built 54 trucks. Okay, tell me about a few of them. I would have yeah. liked to have known a, few, a little bit more about that. The Raminator team, hey, they just got here. They're a brand new team on the circuit. What is going on in Champaign, Illinois that made Dodge want to jump over to the Raminator team? We don't find out. Oh, and you help produce the show. I guess you get more airtime, right? Well, yeah. Plus, they had a, quite a bit of the uh, the early intro footage here was a lot of Bigfoot footage. So they probably provided a lot of this TV show right here and got, got paid a yeah. good penny for it. They, they, they definitely helped with the production. Um, you know, that was covered when the... The show aired, you know, it hit the, the Truck World articles and stuff like that, that Bigfoot definitely had a, a big hand in the production of this show. And of course, they're going to be one of the main characters. Side characters, though, off to the side here, though, we've got Backdraft, Demon, Predator, Godzilla, Blown Thunder. They're all mentioned, but we really don't hear from any of the drivers or the owners other than Rich Blackburn right here of Demon talking about how he's probably the lowest budgeted team in this field and between him and Andy Slifko I would tend to agree he's probably the lowest budget with Andy not too far behind him yeah you know we get a little bit here from some of these drivers uh Slifko gets to talk a little bit we hear from Rick Disharoon but Papa, uh, this is, Papa this, Rick. yeah this is probably a good time we can cover the entire lineup that's here in Daytona again 14 trucks trying to qualify for 12 spots in the show I'm just going to go top to bottom here ammunition with Dale Mitchell and that's how they reported it at the event coverage and I don't know if it was Dale Benier but they listed it as Dale Mitchell, who would go on to drive for the Predator team. Um, of course, Samson with Dan Patrick, we've talked about. Sudden Impact with John Seasocks here in Daytona. Surprised that he didn't really get much airtime. He usually was always willing to talk to the cameras and, you know, participate wherever possible. Alan Pizzo and Predator, we talked about the Pro-MT body already. Bigfoot 14 with Dan Runney. Raminator with Mark Hall. Steve Hearley in Godzilla. He ran a lot of them pro MT races, which was really cool to see. He wanted to go out and compete in the open competition. Pure adrenaline with Randy Brown, one of the breakout stars coming in, you know, just a couple years in the business. Uh, started racing in 2000, and now by 2002, he's one of the top runners on the pro MT circuit. Backdraft with Rick Disharoon, Doug Cole in Blown Thunder, 
a uh, stalwart of all three years on that Trucks Po Pro MT Tour as well, the old Tropical Thunder chassis. D. Wilson's got a new Virginia Giant that he just got for uh, what was it, the 2000 season, I mm-hmm. think, and uh, he or maybe it was 99. He's out here running with one of the newer Patrick chassis. Mac Tools Bigfoot 15 with Eric Tack again. Rich Blackburn and the Demon and Andy Slifko and Eradicator. 14 show up, 12 get to make the show. That's very true here. By the way, Rick Disharoon, on my tour all season long, if you saw him walking, there was something wrong. The man knows how to ride a scooter, believe it or not, and he can ride it anywhere he wants to. He rode into the show office several times, <laughs> just right through the open door. and Oh, hey, look, there goes Rick. He's just riding right past you. Makes you wonder back in the day if he had a scooter back then as well. I need to find this out. I need to know this for uh, investigative purposes. <laughs> but anyway, we get we cut from uh, Rick Dishroon here, who basically talks about uh, he's out here trying to find a sponsor by running with the Pro MT backdraft, of course, one of the heavier trucks on the circuit, but one of the fastest, as we'll find out here in Daytona. And then we cut to Eric Meager, who is a familiar face. If you've not seen him, he used to drive for Bigfoot. He's also the Pro MT president. And he's out here building the track right here. He says, when we show up in the AM, the equipment is ready in place and made available for us to bring necessary ramps out here for the trucks. I do like that they describe what goes on here as far as building the track, how they're not on pavement. They're on the speedway or they're on the turf surface because it's more forgiving. And they cut to a clip. I believe it's Captain Insano uh, jumping at what appears to be Bristol, landing yeah. really hard on the rear end. And you see exactly what pavement can do to these trucks. It's a hard bounce for Captain Insano. And I, I got to say, when they cut back to this, they're going back and they're talking about how they have a red and a blue lane as well. So, hey, we're not only just saying right and left lane right now, we're color coding the lanes. Yeah, and, you know, Eric goes to explain that they do it for aesthetics. They don't really want to make it look like a junkyard. A junkyard, yeah. And I thought it was cool. You know, all those years in Penda, we had the three-car first ramp. And now in Pro-MT, we see the the evolution of the industry where the trucks are going faster and faster. That first jump is now four cars rather than three. I like the announcer, or excuse me, the uh, narrator right here. He says, the crew also installs a starting line indicator, also known as a Christmas tree. A starting line indicator for those that aren't really uh, within the term of the sport. Those are actually the, what's called the lights. Yeah. Um, well, you know, we're, we're marketing this show to people that don't really necessarily have any idea what drag racing even is. Um, they kind of explain what the Christmas tree is, what it does, and then they show them setting up the timing system, which... Uh, and of course, and this, one of the that most was important really cool, parts. by the way, watching them set the timing system up and then watching Meager on a four wheeler running alongside the racing course to test and see if it's giving accurate times. Yeah, I don't know who was on the four wheeler. Meager's there running the computer, but uh, he had somebody out there doing the test runs for him while he was making sure everything's calibrated. And it's got to be what, probably one, two in the morning on the Daytona oh, yeah. Super Stretch. And they're out there testing out the timing system, making testing sure it's timing all going to good. Bugs and everything. And I got to tell you, that's that's a cool little insight behind the scenes. You don't see that. Uh, I can't. I can't give away anything I saw behind the scenes this season, but I can tell you that they do test that timing system as well. Uh, I wish I could. Yeah. I really wish and, I could, guys, because it's 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 a cool way that they do it, but I can't tell you about it. Sorry. Well, it's 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 just good to see that you know people care enough to make sure that the stuff's going to work right. Exactly. Uh, in so many aspects of well, just about everything nowadays, people fly by the seat of their pants and hope everything works right. You know, we we see here they're making sure that this is all going to work. It's going to be legitimate. It's going to function. There's not going to be you know beams out of place or errors. Um, it, it all works out. You know, of course, Monster Jam does a great job with their really cool camera timing system, too, that is very, very accurate. And they they take it seriously. Don't don't uh, let them fool you. They're all about making sure the competition's fair on the racing side, too, especially in the stadium tours. And, uh, you know, some of the RC clubs may want to take heed of, of this information because you got to make sure your timing system works properly. Um we, we've had well, a lot in of my issues. case I actually have a timing system but anyway we've had, we've had a lot of issues over the last numbers of years where stuff gets set up and then you know nobody ever checks it or anything and then it causes issues um it, it's just good to see that when people make the good effort to make sure it all works good test it out take the time to do it it's worth it see sudden impact eradicator backdraft all start rolling right here uh all shown next to a couple of haulers that are out there. By the way, the old haulers, I love the old haulers. We're seeing some, uh, the really cool side shot of the Eradicator hauler before it ended up uh, 
on the side of the road somewhere burned up a few years later. I just, I love that old hauler. I love the shots of the old haulers coming out. And then uh, we get Monster, Monster Trucks, of course, by Eric Meager, or excuse me, Eric Tack of Bigfoot makes an appearance here. And he says the age old saying, Matt, Monster Trucks have more moving parts than any other racing vehicle. And you know, he's not wrong. There's a lot going on inside of a monster truck, that's for sure. And There's a lot going about, on that you don't know about. Yeah, <laughs> he, he talks about having to make sure that screws are tightened and uh, nuts and bolts. And uh, there's always something that has to be tightened up before you go out for that next run. There's a lot to check over. That's very true. Now, here, this might be my favorite quote from our narrator the entire show right here. Forget sponsors and legendary figures. This 350-foot track plays no favorites. Love that quote. It's good stuff, and you know we kind of head into this uh, first commercial break here, uh, coming out of this little segment, and they're they're kind of getting us primed up, showing that we're going to get some racing action on the other side of the break. We get they're tuning on these trucks, they're repairing them, working on them. You know, probably a lot of it from the weekend prior that still needs fixed in a lot of cases. Oh, hell but yeah. um, we we come back from commercial, we get to see some of the other aspects of these trucks bow uh, events, which was really cool to see. Oh, yeah, the glimpse that we get from the Truxpo event, which is basically, uh, as you said earlier, it's it's like watching rolling into a four-wheel jamboree. You're going in, you're going to see a nice little truck show accompanied with these guys as well. Uh, a little bit later, you're going to see a burnout contest, which I thought was a unique addition to a monster truck event, as well as, of course, tough trucks. Yeah, you know, they were always trying to find the new, latest, greatest thing, and the burnout competition was something that kind of stuck. I think they ended up doing that at the Jamboree for a number of years, too, where the winner got a free set of tires or something. Uh-huh. Yeah, they did. But uh, it was it was a pretty cool deal, and we get to see the Sergeant Smash ride truck. Those guys, uh, man, I mean, they're crazy now, but they were even crazier back then. When have you ever been in a ride truck that was doing donuts? Uh, not since Sergeant Smash. <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, I got to say, though, one of the cool things here that we get to see, another behind-the-scenes thing, is the safety inspection done by Tim Hall, and it must be done very very thoroughly. Uh, not many glimpses of it, though. You just kind of see Tim standing next to a truck with a keyboard and kind of looking it over. Or, excuse me, clipboard, not keyboard. Sorry, I was thinking of keyboard warriors for some reason. But anyway, <laughs> uh, you see him. Warrior. Yeah, he's the clipboard warrior. He's walking around and looking at all these trucks and making sure his clipboard was intact. And uh, w- one of the things that I wish they would have shown was the test of the RAI, which, of course, they test right, left, and center lanes on all of these trucks. They test the front and the rear steering. They check over all the ho- the hoses, the brakes, the lines to make sure nothing is leaking on these trucks beforehand. And all we get to see, granted, it's still cool we get to see it. We just kind of see Tim walking around with a clipboard. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But you know what? The, the shot that really I thought was interesting is Tim's checking out the Virginia Giant. The headers on the Virginia Giant are polished chrome. Mm-hmm. Deal Wilson, anything that he's got his hand in, you know it's going to be 110% ready for the show and shine lot beyond being out there on the race course. Just absolutely incredible work. He's testing out the injector hats, making sure the return springs are on them on these trucks. And, you know, they're just going over the general idea. He's inspecting stuff. And um, it was cool to see. I mean, like I said, it'd be cool to cover the RII side of it, too. Um, but you only got however many minutes, uh, 46 minutes to, to make sure that you get everything in and they show snake bite running through the, the shed. Of course, that probably would have been a good time to talk about the RII as well. Yeah, that would have been a great time to mention. Hey, by the way, we've got a button here that shuts these trucks off, but they really don't mention it at all. Uh, our narrator then goes into, and i I really think this is one of the worst descriptions I think I've ever heard. Everything up to this point that the narrator has said has been pretty good. I'm honestly, I'm not, not overwhelmed by anything that he says but he does have some very good quotes here going into this but this right here talking about qualifying is just i is one of the weirdest things i've ever heard these initial races are about crossing the finish line first right now it's about getting the fast times each team competes twice the drivers with the best combined score will then move on to the finals you know that you can move straight to the finals from qualifying wow are we in the early days of penda uh those that fall short will sit them out the very fastest competitors are against are matched against the slower competitors. This is just a very weird way to describe your qualifying setup about how guys are going to qualify and then go straight to the final round. I don't think this guy really did very much research when it comes to an actual NHRA-style bracket like Monster Trucks have ran for years. But anyway, moving on. 
Also, minimum weight here is described or is is described by all of these guys as 9,500 pounds for Pro MT. And then we're shown how they're weighed here. And you see the trucks pull up onto four small scales that weighs these trucks. And we're also told, hey, 9,500 is a minimum weight. Mm-hmm. But these, these guys are out here probably 97 to 10,000 pounds easily. Yeah, you know, it's really cool. They actually weighed these trucks at each event. Most promoters that, you know, instituted a weight limit didn't really do that. There was big discussions at the time in the industry of lowering the Pro MT weight limit to be in line with U.S. Hot Rod, which was 9,000 pounds. Jim Kohler spearheaded that campaign because he had to add a bunch of ballast to his truck at each Pro MT event. And he said, you know, the trucks are or a lot of trucks are lighter, you know, let's just lower the, the limit so everybody can run the same no matter where they go. Uh, Pro MT ended up sticking with their 9,500 pound limit, I believe, but they were the only ones that were really even checking it in the first place. So it was cool to see that everything's on the up and up. I'm sure they had to probably adjust the positions of those scales for each truck based on their wheelbase, of course, because you're not just pulling up onto a grain scale or one of the scales they use for tractor pulling where you drive on, you drive off. You got to get one scale under each tire and it adds up to the whole weight. And we see the example here, you know, Patrick says that he, he runs above 10,000 pounds. It's not just the light weight that makes the truck go fast. Exactly. I would have been interested to see what Backdraft's weight was. It's always been rumored that Backdraft was one of the heaviest trucks on the circuit. I would have liked to have seen how much Backdraft weighed right here because it was always rumored to be between eleven and 12,000 pounds, which was one of the heavier trucks on the circuit. Yeah, you know, it was pretty much a Patrick Turnkey truck, wasn't it? I can't imagine it would be necessarily that much heavier unless Rick added some extra tubing to it somewhere. Um, well, he runs the metal shop, and the guy knows his metal works. Yeah. So it would not yeah. shock me at all if he added extra tubing and extra protection in that thing. Yeah, and he was going to need it, especially after that uh, that Nazareth crash. Maybe that's why he added a bunch of extra cage tubing or something like that. Um he had the experience of seeing what a bad crash could do to one of these trucks at high speed, so I'm sure he wanted to take whatever extra safety precautions were needed. Exactly. Him and Scott Stevens probably had a good conversation with one another about uh, protection for the driver. Of course, Scott Stevens having a really bad wreck at uh, one of the Monster Jam events that you guys just recently covered with Dana Gosh. Yeah, you know, I've actually got some pictures of the construction of the new King Crunch truck that was done after that Charlotte crash and they did like a a triple halo bar behind the driver instead of a single halo main hoop. Um, They kind of took pictures during the construction and sent those pictures in to us hot rod to to pace motorsports to show them here's our new idea. And we want to make sure that we keep, you know, everything safe and we want to get approval and everything like that of what we're doing because we're really going the extra mile to make sure we kind of get the next generation chassis going here with the new King Crunch. It was cool to see. Um, they, they were definitely were learning from the evolution of the sport through the 90s. And every time that we'd have a really bad racing crash, it looked like the cages were starting to get pushed in a little bit. So they, when they needed to, they started adding more and more tubing. And that's when we started to see weights creeping up and up again. And it continues to this day. Yep, sure does. Continues to this day. Uh, But up next is probably one of the worst descriptions I've ever heard for an elimination bracket. Our narrator goes on to say, these initial races are not about crossing the finish line first. Right now, they're about getting fast times. Each competitor competes twice. The drivers with the best combined score will move on to the finals. Those who fall short will sit them out. The very fastest competitors are matched up against the slower ones in the final races, creating an advantage worth fighting for. I didn't know we had combined scores in qualifying. You got the aggregate point system, maybe. I don't know. Did, did we have judgeszone.com <laughs> with Pro MT back in the day? This is a question I must know. People were running on dial up to get the judgeszone.com in the day. No, they, they just took your faster time. Uh, of your two rounds and what's interesting you know we don't really cover it in the tv show they they present this as one event but this is a two-night show Mm -hmm. in daytona and the first night the trucks are supposed to get one qualifying run in each lane um five different trucks made three qualifying attempts the first night and i'm not sure why it doesn't say why in the event coverage but ram munition predator bigfoot 
Mac Tools Bigfoot and Demon all made three runs instead of two. And actually, Steve Hurley on Godzilla and Deal Wilson of Virginia Giant only ran once uh, for their qualifying runs. So not really sure why. The second night, everybody made just two runs. But I guess maybe there was an allowance for a third run for the first race of the weekend if you wanted to, maybe. I, I don't know. The rules for Pro-MT were pretty... Uh, you know, solid and laid out. I know in the Penda days, you could pretty much run as many runs as you wanted to, as long as you, you know, wanted to keep going uh, and keep improving your time. But Pro MT, I know they had it locked down a little bit more than that. And part of me wishes that uh, it's, it's it's done in, in NASCAR now, I guess you could say, but like a timed qualifying session would work out really well for some of these outdoor venues. Like for Pro MT, that would have been awesome. Hey, you guys got a half hour to come up here and do as many runs as you want to to try to get the fastest time that you can. Once that half hour is up, you're done. It'd be cool to have some kind of like uh, – it's it's hard to do it with monster trucks because you can't just sit in line and be ready to go. But, uh, I mean, maybe you could. You pull Well, for this type behind, of racing, I don't see why not. You pull up behind the staging area and, you know, whenever your time is up, then you go if there's enough time left in the session. I guess it could probably work. It'd be pretty cool. Um, group qualifying would be interesting, but it kind of f- kind of favors or gives a, an advantage to those guys that are a little quicker because they get more runs on the track. Uh, the more I think about it out loud, the, the more I don't like that. But the, the open qualifying with the just run as many times as you want, uh, get back in line and do it again, that's kind of interesting. I can get behind that. Yeah, I, th- I think it'd be something that would be kind of cool to see out there for Monster Truck Racing. Hey, you got a time qualifying session. You can run as many times as you want to or as many times as it's in the allotted time that you have. But once it's done and over with, you're parked. You're done. That's your qualifying time, and you got to live with it. Maybe maybe make sure everybody gets at least one run, and then you and then you turn the clock on or something, you know? No, you could do that, too. Uh, to a well-trained ear, though, in this broadcast, you might have heard a very familiar voice in the background as far as the event announcer goes. Of course, I'm talking about Army Armstrong, and he is the voice of the Pro MT. And if you had a well trained ear like mine, you would have heard him just a few moments ago uh, as they were getting ready to pull some trucks to the line right here. Army announces Alan Pizzo and Predators. We see our first pair finally in our qualifying lineup as Alan Pizzo is going to take on John Seesock in Sudden Impact. And as you said earlier, Matt, I don't know why they didn't give John Seesock a little more TV time because you got to think here. This guy's been on pay per view now three times with Sudden Impact for Monster Jam World Finals 1, 2, and 3. He's featured heavily, usually, on every Monster Jam broadcast that he's on at this point. People like John Seesock. Yeah, doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I mean, normally, John was in front of the cameras getting interviewed and and was one of the – either presented as an underdog of some kind or you know just was always willing to work with the production people. But we don't really get to see John talk at all in this episode. We get, do get to see his truck run here. Uh, like you said, up against Alan Pizzo and the Predator. They're the first pair up here for qualifying. Fresh cars, fresh track, and I don't even know. Do we even get to see the whole run, Josh? Yeah, you get to see the whole run here. Pizzo actually crosses the line ahead of Seesock. Uh, very simple track, by the way. Straight line track, down the track, 350 feet, as they said earlier. Jump over four cars, and then they jump over, I believe, what, uh, six or seven at the finish line there. And then they have to run straight past the cars, straight out through the end of the track, which is where the timing beams are located at. And it is said that both of these trucks clock in at just under nine seconds. And boy, does Pizzo's truck look stiff. I mean, it just it does not look like it's handling very well coming off of those cars. Let me see here. I've got the times up. Uh, Pizzo, where's he at in the lineup here? Comes in with an 8.09 on his first run. And John Seesaw coming in with an 8.06 on his first run. So maybe there was some reaction time differences factoring into that. I'm assuming they only count the ET beams for qualifying here. Um, that's that's what the event results show for at least for night number one. Night number two uh, doesn't really matter because the cars were already crushed. So this is definitely a night number one race. It's, it's weird to hear because in the video, to me, it looked clear that Pizzo crossed the finish line first. Yeah, he gets there first. Maybe he – maybe. There was a reaction time difference, and they only counted the ET beams. That's what I'm well, guessing. And that happens in drag racing quite a bit. Sometimes the car that gets the finish line first isn't necessarily the car that's got the faster time. That's right. So there you go. John Seesock actually going to have a faster time here, but loses across the finish line. A weird, weird circumstance right there in Monster Truck Racing. But, hey, it's 
like they said earlier, a combination of NHRA drag racing along with monster truck racing. You have instances like that that happen every now and then. And right after this pass, we get a uh, kind of an up-close peek at the rivalry that you were going to see outside of Monster Jam as the biggest rivalry in motorsports going on after first quarter was over with. We get Bigfoot and Raminator climbing up to the line right here. And Matt, this race right here, this qualifying pass between these two is a hell of a race. It really is. You know, Army plays up the differences, Ford and Dodge, Firestone and Goodyear, um, Illinois and Missouri. And then we zoom in and we see that Dan Runty, he's got those knobby tires on the front of Bigfoot 14, and something mm -hmm. that they didn't really talk about in this show. But I think this was pretty early in the development of these knobby tire, you know, setup that Dan was running and um he was really the only one that ever got these turf tires to really work very well on a consistent basis in racing. He was, you know, took all the time and cut all those lugs out. Of course, we have the RC version now with J Concepts, so you can replicate this Bigfoot look if you want to. But it's a cool little zoom in shot to see how different the tires are there on the Bigfoot Ford. Yeah, huge, it's a huge different tire combination right here. Army, I, I love the fact that uh, when they actually have the rematch in round two with these guys, he goes, Firestone, Goodyear, Ford, Dodge, Illinois, Missouri. However you want to cut it, it's still going to be a slapping contest yep. between these two trucks right here. I love that quote from Army. But this race right here that these guys have, it's really a race between two, very two different driving styles here. Runte launches over the first set of cars, carries the front tires up in the air, and lands the front tires down in no man's land, whereas Hall doesn't get the whole shot but he's still with bigfoot he rides over the top of the first four cars and then just puts the power down in no man's land and by the time they get to the second set of cars they're even and when they land and they come across the actual finish line out towards past those cars a little ways raminator is going to get there first and i gotta say that's got to be a sub uh, sub uh sub eight second run at least 7.5 somewhere in there you probably got the official time right there we see here, Raminator, Mark Hall, 6.84 okay, for the first then. run, and uh, Dan Runty, 6.802. So another instance where the reaction time doesn't translate at the other end of the track. Raminator obviously gets to the line first, maybe a tire length difference, but the difference must have been down on the starting line in terms of the ETs because these two trucks, though, are you can tell they're on kill i mean they're getting big time air over the jumps compared to the first pair that was out there even though it's just a qualifying shot these guys want to go faster than the person in the other lane of course i mean at the time if i remember correctly bigfoot is still sponsored by ford mm -hmm. and there's the dodge truck in the other lane this is the two big manufacturers right here and as i said over the next 10 20 years this is your special events rivalry right here this is your this is your Tom Minson, Dennis Anderson, and for those that are a Monster Jam eccentric people that happen to listen to this show, this is your rivalry, Dan Runte and Mark Hall. And these guys are always out for each other's blood when they're racing each other, but they are great friends off the track. And these races with these guys, I've seen many of them myself over at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, as well as, uh, I believe, anywhere along the Midwest. These trucks have raced each other, and every single time, it is a Donnybrook. They go after it for sure. The, the, the we, we second some, run here, though, this oh, is, the, the interesting thing here, though, is on the second run, Matt, we get a very weird edit for Bigfoot. And it looks like, as you said earlier, this is a two-day event. It looks like they splice together both second round passes for Bigfoot because Runte in, I believe it's, was it day two? I think we were talking earlier before this day two, Bigfoot has a landing in no man's land where it pops up into a wheelie and when the front tires come down, it slaps onto the race lane ramp for the second jump and it launches bigfoot and almost a sky wheelie over the cars and the truck lands really hard on the right rear and kind of folds over a little bit i believe it bends a sway bar it bends a shock it's a hard impact for bigfoot however they cut they cut in and out of this race and it does like it goes from the sky wheelie at one point to flying straight over the cars a second time it's just a weird edit right there yeah you know remember to this point we've all been seeing night one action and then they talk about Dan having some suspension issues. Really, this is happening on the second night, these suspension issues. So they're thrashing. They kind of get the truck uh, buttoned back together somewhat, 
and then they go out and they run the second qualifier and everything just completely unwinds for the Bigfoot team. Uh, you can even see the difference in the weather. You know, it's cloudier the second day for qualifying. Uh, maybe it's a little later in the day. It's a little darker. And the truck just drives underneath itself in the air and really comes down, lands hard on, uh, what is it, the left rear? and the Right rear, really hard. Right rear. Doesn't he just not doing the truck any favors. Uh, and the way you can figure this out is, again, I'm, I'm going off of the – the qualifying runs here, uh, let me find Runty had the slower run in, in round number two with a, uh, oh, maybe it was the first night. Hold on. 6.5, 6.1 on the second night. So maybe this was the second round of the first night and they spliced it in with night two um, where he had, you know, a, a seven and a half second run. I mean, the run wasn't that bad. It was just way out of control. Oh, yeah, it was uh, what we would call in the industry controlled chaos for Bigfoot right there. Like I said, though, a very weird edit. I don't understand the meaning behind that edit. Yeah, you know, they're trying to blend these two nights of action into one show, and we're going to see throughout the rest of this event that they're going to carry storylines from both nights into kind of one complete package here. And uh, they're talking with Runty. They show the, the replay again, the truck again, landing really nasty on the right rear. Tweaks the sway bar out real bad. Damage is a shock. We get to talk with uh, Rick Petrolin here with the TV cameras. He's explaining the issues that the truck has. And we see Dan working. That had, that had to hurt, you know, coming down landing that way for Dan too. Uh, but there's there's no time to to care for yourself there. There's work to be done. There's definitely some work to be done, and Bigfoot certainly lost that slapping contest that Army Armstrong was talking about right there. He got slapped pretty hard on that pass there from Runte. One of our qualifying passes was a rough ride. Everything we did to the truck to correct what it was doing actually backfired and made the situation worse, according to Dan Runte. Bigfoot, like we said, obviously shown here with the uh, bent sway bar. They actually got the sway bar arm off the truck at this point, and a bent shock. And I got to tell you, that's just it's a hard pass for Bigfoot. And you got to wonder, is he going to come back? Well, obviously, he's Bigfoot. <laughs> we come back from commercial right here. And that's when we get to see this 45-second burnout pad right here. Uh, burnout commences for 45 seconds, and our narrator called it a peel-out cloud of smoke. I mean, you know, that's, that's another word for burnout. You do a peel-out. Um, I thought it was cool that they, like, scraped the – the concrete back off after each run to kind of get it back to zero and they're hitting it with a hot mop or something, you know, to, to clean it. Oh, you got to make it fair. Uh, them guys are putting on a show though, you know, running through the gears with a burnout in the two wheel drive trucks. Uh, this is still, you know, there's a little bit of that nineties mini truck culture still holding on, especially down South where the S tens and the Rangers are really popular and they're, doing the project trucks and stuff, and they, they're they good at doing burnouts. I'll definitely tell you that. Oh, that's for sure. Uh, we get our top seeds of the bracket listed here, and on the broadcast it's listed as Bigfoot, Eradicator, Backdraft, Samson, Mac Tools, Bigfoot, and Raminator. And our lower seeds are listed as Blown Thunder, Pure Adrenaline, Sudden Wrong. Impact, Godzilla, Predator, and Ramunition. Yeah, you know, they, they I think they got Pure Adrenaline and Eradicator mixed up here on the list because... I've got it. Uh, let me see here. Eradicator's lumped into the top six qualifiers. He qualified ninth and eighth in the two nights of racing. Pure Adrenaline uh, qualified third and fifth in night one and two. So, you know, again, they're, they get a little bit of an issue <laughs> with the getting the facts straight. But at this point now, we're moving on to the second night of action in terms of what we're showing in the brackets for the racing. Um, because Bigfoot, uh, he's going to get a solo run, Josh. What happened? Uh, it's going to look like Blown Thunder here. I mean, they, by the way, they just say Blown Thunder's driver. They don't mention Doug Cole behind the wheel. They just say, hey, it's Blown Thunder's driver. He pulls to the line, and all of a sudden, the truck shuts off, and it does not refire. They hook it up to a jump box. They had three other crews running out there to no avail. And unfortunately for Blown Thunder, it's going to be a uh, blown night and a lot of blown income as Bigfoot's going to get a buy run into round number two. Yeah, you know, it's a bummer that they couldn't get Doug Cole's blown thunder truck ready to go. I feel like it was maybe an inside monster jam. Uh, something similar happened. It was like blown thunder turns into blown opportunity. And I thought it was a funny play on words, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's just couldn't, couldn't make the call. Something happened. It, it said that he forgot to tighten what a 25 cent screw. Cent 
Yeah, 25 and, cents uh, grew, and that's what caused him the chance to move on here. It'll put you out in any time. And even the best of the best, Tom Mentz, you know, has had those issues on occasion. On TV, where it'll show you this little 10-cent part, this is what put me out of competition for the night. Yep, I remember the first time I saw that Goldberg had been defeated on TV. Mince was holding the part in his hands. This little piece right here is what cost us to win. So we get a buy run out of Bigfoot here. Runty going to take it, you know, fairly easy, probably a 70, 75% run. And what I caught, though, was you notice the rear suspension does not look great coming over the second set of cars. The shocks don't drop out the way that they should. It's almost like the left rear still is a little bit messed up because it's like the shock is sticking a little bit. Uh, the, that left rear just kind of stays up, up against the bed and only drops about a third of the way through its suspension cycle. And then Dan takes a landing. Yeah. I wonder if they didn't catch that there was an issue on the left sides and they just went ahead and fixed the right sides uh, before that round of racing right there. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to guarantee you when they saw that they went back to the back and they had to make some sort of adjustment on that truck. Well, you know that they had the video camera rolling and, and probably I don't, they might have still been running the dyno equipment on the trucks at this point, showing the shock travel and everything. And if it didn't match up side to side, they knew there was going to be a problem. See pure adrenaline here and Randy Brown lose a nail biter to Samson. Ram and are going to take out Ramunition. And then we get a quick clip of backdraft taking on Predator before we cut away and we show trouble for Samson. As Dan says, he didn't get it into second gear properly. He thinks that he broke the reverser. Uh, the repair to the truck to move it forward is simple. However, Dan's, Dan's going to have, uh, he's, he's a loner out here, basically. He's the only crew guy on the truck, even though we see somebody sitting there right next to him as he's working on it. Uh, not, yeah, he's he's a loner with one of the biggest crews that we see here by the end of the show with everybody wearing <laughs> Samson crew shirts. What's interesting is, is we're really bopping between these nights of action here. That uh, pure adrenaline Samson race was a second round race in the second night. Um then we go back to that Raminator ammunition first round race, and Dan Patrick's transmission issues actually happened on night one. So they're really splicing together a lot of storylines and a lot of runs here to try to put a cohesive entertainment package together for the viewers at home. We get round one going to continue right here with a uh, pure adrenaline taking on sudden impact, which was odd just because we saw Randy Brown already losing round one. Well, because it's <laughs> night one sudden impact versus pure adrenaline um, that we get to see here again, just bopping back and forth like crazy. Godzilla also going to have some problems. It's not going to be able to make a pass and give Eric Tack a buy into the next round, which, according to our broadcast team right here, buys Dan Patrick a couple extra minutes to get Samson 100%. Tack runs solo, and he has a wicked landing, though, off of the first set of cars. It pitches Bigfoot to the right, and the left side tires are all that's going to go up the side of the ramp. I love the fact that right after they say that, they go, we have to consult the rule book, and then we cut to the back, and we see uh, Lee Bob Chandler and somebody else literally looking at a rule book and flipping through pages. Yeah, this it's uh, Bob Chandler, and I think uh, it might be Tim Hall. They're going through the rule book, and that's what's buying – Dan Patrick all this time to get his truck fixes because we have a rules controversy that we need to settle and figure out what's going to happen with Eric Tack. Exactly. Uh, what's going to eventually happen though right here is, is he's going to still advance. He's still in the bracket. However, he is not going to record a time and he's going to be taking on the fast loser. So my, my best guess here is that he's going to basically forfeit lane choice to the fast loser. Uh, let me see what it says here in the event results. I would think that a round one victory would still trump the fast loser in terms of having the lane choice. However, he still doesn't set a time. So night two. Well, he didn't have a time. Uh, it says that Mac Tools does, in fact, have lane choice over backdraft in round number two. Okay, then. Well, I was wrong. <laughs> but at the same at the same time, though, I would have I would have assumed that a truck that set a time would still have lane choice over a truck that did not. That's just my opinion. Well, Granted, there was a loss there involved in setting right. that time. Yeah, it's, you're, you're it's one of the things where you're you're kind of fifty fifty in the air on it. You're coming in through the loser bracket. You're not getting lane choice regardless, and I think that's probably the right way to do it. Moving into round two, our top four in round two: Bigfoot, Raminator, Samson, and Backdraft seated behind them as Mac Tools, Predator. Pure Adrenaline and Ramunition. We see some more highlights right here as we get a clip glimpse of another Raminator Ramunition matchup. Mac Tools taking on Backtraff, a split screen of Ramunition. Then we get a Predator versus Raminator matchup, Bigfoot versus Ramunition, 
A lot of highlights of ammunition in this this little minute and a half long stretch that we have right here. Uh, it's not fully explained as this entire quarterfinal round here because we literally just had the the top four of each side explained to us, as well as the bottom seated bracket, and then we get this mixed matchup of pairs right here. And I can't tell you which one's day one and which one's day two. Well, this is pretty much all day two action here. Uh, before we got into that round of monster trucks, we got a little bit of tough truck action. I wanted to point out Thomas Ray White taking an absolute banger shot in the Twister 3 truck. Uh, really, really nasty landing. And then we get to see another truck roll over. Uh, the monster truck action, you know, night two, round two. Uh, Bigfoot taking out ammunition, as you said. Mac Tools uh, gonna beat Backdraft because Backdraft DQs on the two and two rule. Um, Backdraft gets to the line first, and then we hear Army saying the winner is gonna be the Mac Tools Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. uh, they kind of fast forwarded through that run to a degree where it's it's a little hard to catch um, Backdraft missing that ramp if you're not really looking at it. Uh, Raminator gonna beat Predator. Samson taking out Pure Adrenaline. Um, we kind of then go into this little thing saying that Eric Tax, the only driver here that has won in Daytona. Um, out of our final four, yeah. Out he's of our final driver four. Here. Oh, he's really uh, the only driver here that has won at Daytona because uh, they say the year before he won in Tonka. In 2000, he won both nights in Tonka in Daytona, and then he won one night in 2001 with Bigfoot Firestone, the Centennial Scheme, and David Morrison Equalizer won the other night in 2001. So Tack, the only one in the field with an actual event victory in Daytona, he's got the field covered three to nothing uh, in terms of the score for trophies, and we get to hear Eric talking a little bit about you know having the confidence going into a place where you've won before. Exactly, and uh, he's going to have a heck of a Final Four here matchup. It's going to be Bigfoot, Bigfoot, Mac, Tools, Raminator, and Samson, your Final Four. Uh, like I said, Tack, the only previous winner here. However, it's not going to end up being a very good night for Team Bigfoot. No, it's not. You know, we go into the semifinals, and they're kind of billing Bigfoot and Samson as both being kind of wounded. But really, Patrick's damage was suffered the night before, and... I'm sure he put a new transmission into the truck for night number two, and he's running 100 percent. The trucks take off, and we see that Bigfoot really loses power. Samson cruising on for the easy win there, and Dan Runty going to explain what happens here with the Bigfoot Ford. Yeah, it's a ring and pinion problem here in the back of the Bigfoot machine, and if this is from the night where it took that really hard landing on the rear end, then – Ring and pinion problem is not so surprising as far as that landing goes. You had to know it had to have knocked a few other things loose besides Dan's teeth on that pass. Uh, shame for Bigfoot right here. However, we just talked up Mac Tools Bigfoot and how uh, Eric Ma or excuse me Eric Tack is the only guy that has wins here at Daytona. Well, that's going to change as Tack has a very similar issue. It looks exactly the same as what happens to Runte. It was in the exact same lane as what happened with Runte. The truck just lays over, and Raminator going to go on to take the victory over Samson. Yeah, just no power at all for the Mac Tools Bigfoot. It's, it looks like that he's only got front-wheel drive as well. And you think you know, this night, too, the Bigfoot guys are thrashing because of all the issues that they've had. And but at that point, things start to fall by the wayside. Not that you could change a ring and pinion that quick necessarily, but it's something that they didn't know about. So Tack goes to hit the loud pedal, and just the front wheels are going to spin. So we got a Dodge versus Chevrolet with some big arms. Final. We got a pretty strong arm Chevrolet taking on a Ram with a lot of horns on the front of it and the side of it. I got to tell you, the Raminator Dodge going to go up against the Chevrolet they call Samson. Classic Army Armstrong line as they get the drivers ready to line up right here, hyping this manufacturer battle. Whole shot going to go to the big Ram, and my goodness, Mark Hall never looks back. He maintains the lead through no man's land and over the cars. It appears, though, as Samson starts to veer a little bit to the right. It does make a legal pass, but that truck is not straight through uh, no man's land going to the cars. He's very pushing about like pushing the center boundary line, honestly, when he flies over the second jump, very low to the ground, which was kind of uncharacteristic for these trucks on this particular track right here for Samson. However, though, just not enough to overcome that big Dodge horsepower being pushed out in that right hand lane. Yeah, you know, that low jump from Samson there, just, I'd call it a barely legal run. I mean, I think he got both tires up because they they all four come off the ground pretty decent. It's just a lot lower because he got a glancing blow on that ramp. And 
had there been another 60 feet in the course, I think Patrick would have passed him because he had all kind of momentum from landing early and winding the truck out. But our call on the Raminator in the Pro-MT season debut for 2002 uh, with the Raminator guys. He's going to take the win, and he actually took both nights of competition here in Daytona in 2002. It's kind of the start of a Raminator dynasty. We'll get to that in a moment, though, here as we get an interview with Dan Patrick. Obviously, this is taped inside of his hauler. I'm going to assume this is the beginning of day two here uh, where they do this interview with Patrick. Yeah. He says, uh, they work really hard coming up through the ranks. They've got good equipment and we're 100% prepared. I thought with a new motor program that they were going to stumble a little bit, but they really got the combination. It worked out and they got it for them. Uh, they're gonna, they, they took it right here. Basically, Dan giving them all the props in the world. Mark Hall is going to be interviewed directly after winning the race. He says, this is wonderful. We've worked 15 years to get here. I tried to keep a cool head and not think about it much. I think sometimes things mess. Uh, sometimes I mess things up if I think too much about it. A uh, quick little interview there from Mark Hall, who is always the consummate gentleman, by the way, whenever he is interviewed by anybody. And then we get Dan Runte out of nowhere here with an interview. He says, this is stiff competition. We put 12 trucks within a half a second of one another in qualifying. That's a tough field to get into. There's so many variables, and you miss one, and you're out. That's right. You know, uh, maybe not a half a second. <laughs> uh, all 12 trucks, let's see, 6.15 to 7.82. So a eh, second and a half plus a little uh, for the, for that whole field. But, you know, it's still pretty close competition on a 350 foot track. The show's not over, though, Josh. It's time for freestyle. Yeah, we get some really cool freestyle clips here. And I got to say, one of the best van hits I think I have ever seen is one where Mac Tools backsides of this van stack that they have out here, and it just shoots the str the truck straight up into the air. Perfect sky wheelie right on top of the van. Excellently done by Eric Tack. We also see a similar hit a little bit later here by uh, Pure Adrenaline and Randy Brown, where uh, he literally stuffs the front end into the ground and pulls a slap wheelie out of it. It's an amazing slap wheelie, and in my opinion, this is my favorite kind of slap wheelie because Randy Brown is using every ounce of horsepower in the Pure Adrenaline truck to keep the front end up on that thing. It shifts mid-wheelie because he's got the foot to the floor, and he's just winding that thing out, just getting it right at that perfect balance point where the truck isn't coming down. It's not going up. He's just riding that wheelie full throttle into the night sky in Daytona down the super stretch. It's one of my favorite slap wheelies ever captured on camera. Yep, that's that's an incredibly good one. There's also a shot of him coming the other way with a slap wheelie. And you find out the cameraman probably thinks he's a little bit too close because as soon as the truck pops up into the wheelie, the camera cuts away and it appears the cameraman saying, I'm done and just takes off. I would agree with the cameraman. Uh, yeah, I would have agreed too you know, at that point because it looked like he was coming right at him. This is an MTRA sanctioned event, of course. Um, I don't know why a cameraman was there. They, they I, really I don't should, know why he was that close. Period. Should not have been, but thankfully, I'm sure everybody was okay. One of the other cool shots I like from this freestyle setup here too is Dan Patrick puts Samson into like a four wheel drift in the shutdown area, just oh, yeah. slinging dirt everywhere. There's that, and then they do a quick little fast-forward clip of Mac Tools riding the slap wheelie all the way down the center lanes. Yeah, you know, Eric Tack and, and Dan Runney, especially at this time, those trucks were set up in a way that they really did great slap wheelies. Um, you could see how tight the transmission and everything is, is once they got those fixed. Maybe it was from night one of action, even this very style, because we were getting both nights of uh, footage here, and... We see, I think it's Runty, doesn't quite get a perfect launch on that little dirt jump for the slap wheelie, but the truck gets crossed up, he lands, he pulls into it, and the truck just like pulls itself back straight because it has so much torque and grip to pull himself into that slap wheelie and ride it out a little bit. That was, the, that was basically all your freestyle, ladies and gentlemen. It was really quick there at the end of the broadcast. Uh, Bob Chandler kind of closes things out here. He says, my goal is to see an international champion, basically, for Pro-MT. Of course, that never happened. Another goal that was never realized there for Mr. Chandler. But I got to say, though, overall, I enjoyed this. But at the same time, there was, there was so much going on here. They, Like you said, they're editing together two shows to try to put together one. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, you know, it's unfortunate that Truxpo pulled the plug on this series after the 2002 season. They didn't do the events anymore. Pro-MT you know, was looking for other outlets to do shows. I want to say they 
sanctioned a, a few more events that, under that banner that weren't like Trucks Po uh, events, but uh, they obviously weren't on the same scale as these big super speedway shows. Um, the the show itself, you know, we're getting to the point here where the show ends. Uh, the drivers are signing autographs, and and the TV show kind of signs off, and that's the end of it. But um, for what it is, and for what it was intended for, meaning the home audience that doesn't see monster trucks all the time on TV, getting their their mouth wet a little bit with the, the industry, um, it's not a bad show. You know, it gets the story across. It it shows some action. It builds some drama. It, it keeps the viewer engaged. And I give it uh, I give it a probably a six point nine out of ten. If you're watching it for the bracket following, a, I'm going to give it a 0. .69 out of 10. Yeah, I was about to say. I gave it a 5 out of 10 myself. Uh, like I said, good show. Could have been explained a little bit better in some cases. Like uh, the worst description I've ever heard of as far as a uh, elimination-style bracket, period. How does qualifying work? Yeah, how does qualifying work, ladies and gentlemen? Well, the fast truck takes on the slow truck. Now, that, that seems pretty simple obvious explanation but they try to turn it into one of those things where you get, like you ever see the uh the gif where the guy's kind of staring off into the abyss but in the background you see all the algebra problems around his head yeah that was the description of that in my head that's what i pictured was just a bunch of algebra problems flying across my head the only other major gripe that i had as far as this was the fact that we didn't see anything to do with john seesock other than the truck itself like we said one of the most presentable guys you could put on television at this point honestly if you're a kid that's scrolling through here and you've seen monster trucks on television before other than bigfoot that's probably the most recognizable name that you're going to see on this show at this point is sudden impact because like we said he's been to three live pay-per-views in, in las vegas by this point he's been all over monster jam television he's one of the most well-spoken guys in the industry at this point as well I don't understand the reasoning behind not putting John Seesock on here in some way, shape, or form other than just the truck running. Yeah, I mean, not like I said, there's not much explanation to it. Uh, the YouTube version that we're watching here, we don't really get to see much of the credits, I don't think, either, because you know they, they ran them real tiny up in the corner. Yeah, it was one of I those things where the credits went really fast, too, so you couldn't yeah, really see anything. So it, the the resolution isn't the best, and it cuts off after like a second and a half. So uh, the writer uh, and or production coordinator, uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to send them uh, a nasty gram to ask them why John Seesaw wasn't talking in the show. Yeah, I know, and I, I mean I'm going to send them an email about a 20-year-old show that they haven't literally – put on television 20 years they're probably gonna be like what is this about you but know, anyway talking about it being on tv this aired surprisingly late um they were airing it not all that long ago if i remember correctly like like sporadically they would just air it every now and then um it was weird you know such an old show but they would they'd throw it up every now and then i guess if they needed something to fill programming time yeah, hell if you have you got something just sitting back there and you're not making any money off of it just sitting there then why not air it every now and then and plus yeah. it's it's unique it's something that put put these trucks out there and maybe there are some people out there that don't know about the bigfoot raminator rivalry which by the way jumping right into this this was like we said earlier kind of the beginning of the raminator dynasty i guess you could say it was Raminator wins the 2002 Pro NT Championship, then goes on to win the 2002 um, Special Events Championship, and then would go on from 2001, Matt, all the way up to 2010. Mark Hall would win nine Special Events Championships, and the other one was won by Jeremy Dishman and Ramunition in 2006. Yeah, I mean, they did a phenomenal job over the years, and it, this is just one man's opinion, but I think that that original Raminator look is just unbeatable. It's simple, it's clean, it gets the branding across. I love it. Oh, I love it, too. Speaking of which, that Raminator dynasty, broken apart by Bigfoot in 2011, and then Mark Hall went on to win three more right afterwards. So <laughs> yeah. that truck and that sponsorship, they have, they've had it now for 20 years. And it is one of the longest running sponsorships in monster truck racing history. And well, they, had, they, they had a break in the middle. Well, they had a small break, but not a very long break between them and Dodge. They got back together. And I got to say, like I said, these guys are the perfect team for Dodge to have representing them. 
They are consummate professionals. They are two of the nicest guys in Monstruck Racing history, period. And I'm incredibly happy to see that that sponsorship and that truck name has stuck around this long. They run a great business. They're, they're very good people, honest people. They they run their business, quote unquote, the right way, you know, in an honest fashion. Um, they're great representatives for their sponsors, and it proves great representatives for the sport too. Yeah, their their lasting power of being competitive and being professional um, speaks for itself. I mean, they're just a great team, and two well deserving Hall of Famers that went into the International Monster Truck Hall of Fame this past year. Yep, very true. Congratulations to them on that. Yes. Congratulations for a 20-year legacy of Raminator as well as Ramunition. Mm-hmm. Don't forget. Uh, Got to say, though, Matt, this is my first show back for the Retro Monster Truck Review. Probably rough in some spots. I'm about four months out of practice. But, hey, we've got some more <laughs> coming down the line uh, as far as these go. I don't know if we're going to keep trying to do this weekly or biweekly or whatever. I still uh, love doing this show, and it's good to be back. As time permits, you as know, time permits, yeah. uh, I'm sure we'll have some other guest hosts in between you and I'll be bopping back and forth between main host duties, I think, for a little while yet, because you're still a pretty busy guy. And, um, you know, we've we've had a lot of fun throughout this first quarter, changing it up a little bit, doing uh, different things, different, you know, co-hosts and wide variety of different events. But we, we've had a lot of fun this Which, year. By the way, everybody that's listening, give Matt a round of applause silently in, in your living rooms while you're listening to this on your headphones because he did a heck of a job keeping this show going while I've been on the road. Uh, well, thank you. You know, I, I want to make sure to mention, you know, please go out there, donate blood. Um, you know, all the stuff I normally say, find your Vitalant location, American Red Cross, Central Blood Bank. Uh, that stuff matters. Uh, if you're looking for, you know, somebody to talk to, if you haven't uh, heard from some of your friends in a while, you never know uh, when somebody may need a, a helping hand or just someone to lend an ear. So, um, Josh, I know you put the National Suicide Prevention Hotline up each week with the show. Um, I know a lot of people appreciate that, too. So make sure uh, reach out to your buddies, reach out to people uh, if you're needing any help. I'll tell you what, Josh, how about we just cover Monster Trucks 2000 next week? That you know what? That is a great idea. We'll go Let's ahead and we'll cover Monster Trucks 2000 next week here on the show. And uh, right after that, what do you say we cover um, Monster Trucks 2000? Well, we're doing it next week, so we'll get to take. Well, care we can of. we can do it two weeks in a row. We can cover each round weekly. <laughs> we'll do that as a marathon, perhaps. There, there we go. Uh, the next few shows, a marathon of Monster Trucks 2000. We'll talk about it over and over and over again. By the way, little known fact, the first event Pro MT put on was Monster Trucks 2000. Did you know that? That's right. What a way to start your uh, your your national hot rod association based monster truck racing series by putting that on. But anyway, I'm your host with the most with the retro monster truck review, Josh Rhodes. For Matt Stoltz, we'll see you all again on the tracks across America. Just throw that Daytona music in as the tag at the end. I thought about putting in like the Daytona USA thing. Daytona. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, put put that in as the as the end tag. Yeah, we'll do that. I've been starting. I I truly just I don't know what to think about this qualifying description. It's just it's very weird. It's very vague, and going straight to the finals is just it it's weird. It's very dumb to me.